It's been a minute. We waited, I think it's been like two weeks now since we uh, did our WGI recap. Yeah, life happens. Busy. Uh, just letting all the YouTube videos and stuff roll in anyway. And yeah, kind of had... Robert, Let Robert Martinez get all of his editing done before we try to jump into anything. Man's Thank everywhere. God for those dudes, for real though, for hooking all these kids up with quality videos of their of their stuff and to remember their season. I think that's killer. Him and George and Evan Guerra, Drumline AV. So shout out to those dudes. Yep, doing some great work. But we're not going to banter too much before we jump into today's amazing guest. Welcome everyone to the Aged Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Fantini, and with me as always is... Evan Worrell. And before we get going, make sure you head over to the YouTube channel if you're listening on podcast services. Ch- check out all the content over there. Head to LoneStarPercussion.com. Use the discount code AGEDOUT. Save yourself $10 on any order of $50 or more. Check us out on social media so you never miss an update. And all right, let's get into today's guest. I don't think I left any of the important stuff out there. Evan, take it away. Now, I actually have used that Lone Star percussion code uh, a couple times while ordering his uh, his sticks from Lone Star. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, without any further ado, uh, thanks for joining us, Tim. What's up, man? Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I think everybody will see the name in the in the description. So, Tim Fairbanks with us. This one's probably long overdue for how many hours we've all spent together in a room and just how well we know each other. But the timing of it, I will say, feels very right. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about it. Tim has some some creative, inter- interesting theories and ideas uh, that he wanted to bounce off of us. But first of all, man, take us a little bit through just kind of your bio of getting in the activity, jumping in, rising up the ranks, and so on. Sure thing. Um, first, like I said, thanks for having me. I think what you guys are doing is awesome. I think uh, the number of these types of media outlets that are happening right now is very cool. Um, I know that that's not, uh, not everybody thinks that. I think uh, there's a lot of people that think that people should just talk if they're well qualified. But the idea that talking about our actual activity, um, it shouldn't be a secret, right? That thousands and thousands of people enjoy it every year and everybody's talking about it anyway. I think you, you bringing people in to kind of peel back the onion on DCI, WGI, all the different marching arts, I think is a very cool thing. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a shout out for that. Um, and then I'll just go quick through my background. It's not super exciting, so I'll, I'll give you the bullet points. Um, and I'm, I'm a little old in the tooth compared to some of you guys. So um, the numbers get pretty low when you start talking about when I started. Um, but I, I did march with the Glassman Drum Bugle Corps, RIP, um, in 1991, 92, and 93. Um, I played cymbals there my first year. Um, I learned enough about cymbals that year to know that I didn't want to play cymbals anymore. Um, (laughs) And then played snare drum in 92 and 93. In the meantime, went to Michigan State, realized what else was out there. They had a lot of of talent in Michigan State. Well, they always do, but early 90s, it was was kind of uh, insane up there with drum corps talent. Um, My sophomore year, I think there was, 10 snares and every one of them had just marched to the top full drum corps. Wow. Um, so did that. And then in the meantime, went to Phantom Regiment, marched there in 1994. And then I was the section leader and center snare in 95 and 96. Um, fortunate enough to age out with the championship. Um, one of the more was, iconic Phantom Regiment shows ever, Defiant Heart. Yep. Yeah, it was a good one. It was a fun one. And, it's interesting, you know, we talk a lot about the process and how the seasons go and that one everybody looks back on as this kind of glory year, but uh, marching the other years, especially 95 and 96, nothing really felt any different. Um, I mean, we just worked, Bettis was there and Prosper was there in 95. We just worked our asses off all summer long. And in one of the years we got fifth and in one of the years we got first, but the process was the same either way. So, like, if you think back to the actual experience, the last minute of the season then informed the next 25 years of that show's legacy. Um, but I've always thought that um, 95, we actually were uh, maybe a better drum line and worked just as hard. Um, so, aged out in 96, went back and taught a little bit in 97. Um, met Jody, my wife, uh, moved down here to Centerville and then started teaching at Centerville's drum line in 1997 basically as soon as I got here. Um, they hired me to uh, teach the horn line visual. 
which is kind of a Centerville joke because at the time, Centerville's drumline was very uh, uh, sucky. I don't know how to <laughs> say it. They were they were just awful. Less experienced. Was around those years, yes, less experienced. Um, but they were just real bad, and they didn't have any any kind of knowledge of drum corps or anything like that. And th- their stick was that they were like a, a drum set on the field. And in some years, like in the early early nineties, it was pretty cool. Um, by the time the late nineties hit, it was just lame. Um, so I, I got hired to teach the horn line, and Jody had told Wayne Markworth, who was our boss at the time, he's like, "Well, you know, he knows a little bit about drums too." Because, you know, they already had a drum guy, like one dude to run the drum line. And like, as soon as I showed up, I remember, I'll never forget that day. But they had like their crab step, they had the wrong feet behind. And they they oh, had no. plastic heads, like coated plastic heads on their snare drums. Oof. So that you could hear the brushes. And I was like, bro, I, like, I need to help these kids immediately. <laughs> um, so then uh, I did. By that winter, I was the director, and we started an indoor line in that uh, spring of 98. Um, I had done a couple indoor lines before that myself up in uh, when I was at Michigan State. Did the Weeders and Spirit of Ontario and then the Phantom Regiment uh, in 95, 96, and 97, and then started my own group in 98. So, And we came out in open class. We probably shouldn't have, um, but my, my wife did the color guard, and they were in open class. So I was like, all right, well, I guess we're in open class too. Um, probably should have definitely been an A to start, but we just went for it. Um, just taught really aggressively. The staff was me, Noah Bellamy, Kevin Namaki, Devin Namaki, and Andy Scheibel. Um, and we were all like young and fresh and just ready to go for it. Um, and so then stayed at Centerville. I've been there. This is my 25th year there. Um, in the meantime, I've done a lot of other things have been at Rhythm X for 20 years, um, did some different drum corps throughout my time. Um, I worked with the Blue Coats for three years, uh, well, four years, did the drill there for three years, Blue Stars for a number of years, and I'm at the Crossland right now. Um, I've done a lot of international judging and worked with a couple of international groups. Uh, really, really heavily involved in WGI in general, uh, in the company side of things, not just having groups, but I really care a lot about the activity. It gave me a lot, so I like to give back to it. Does your mom still work at WGI? Did you just bring my mom up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your mom doing, Evan? Uh, nurse. She's she's camping in North Carolina right now with my dad. Okay, but I'm cool. pretty sure that your mom sold uh, my parents' <laughs> WGI tickets multiple times. So. <laughs> yeah, she does. She she's awesome, and she works at the at the WGI office. Does tickets. And she's obviously a proud mom. Well, I've, I've had to train her over the years to not pick up the phone and say, you know, WGI, this is Tim's mom. How can I help you? <laughs> um, <laughs> but people usually make the connection. She, she's met a lot of really nice people, people like your parents that she's sold tickets to over the years. So that's a, that's a cool thing. Heck yeah. Team Fairbanks. Mom, Jody, yep. Tim. Yep. Hold Carter, it down. Logan. Carter, Logan. Yeah. All of them. Yep. Through the ranks, man. Band family. Love it. Um, so, did Michigan State, were they involved in, like, PASIC and stuff at the time, too? Okay. Yep. Yeah, that was late 90s, like, 90, or early 90s, 90, 91, 92, 93. It was, like, North Texas, UK, Moorhead, Michigan State were always the big PASIC line. Um, and we were good. I mean, it was it was a precursor to WGI, but we did drill, and it was mostly just about how many beats we could fit into six minutes. Um and take the smallest step sizes we could. Had our band <laughs> uniforms rocking the whole time. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was cool. Being Moorhead guys, we've seen a handful of those old PASIC lines, and they definitely could drum. Some really good yeah. drumming going on in the 90s in those lines. Yeah, I always envied the drills. Like, man, you guys just got to stand there and ram. That's what's up. <laughs> That's what it yeah, should be. Sure. And, and I got the fortunate uh, endeavor of being taught by a number of really great people at Michigan State, Chris Thompson was my first teacher there. He did Madison in the 80s, like 88 Madison. Kind Ooh, of that's one of my favorite of shows. Time. Um, and then Dave Mace uh, was from the Cadets. He he was awesome. He really taught me a lot. Um, and he kind of has, has a cool story. I don't know if he's ever going to listen to this or not. If he, if he does, what's up, Dave? But he marched two years of Cadets, and he marched 87 and 90 only. So he only marched drum corps twice and has two perfect drum scores. 
mm-hmm. which is like unheard of. It's got to be the only <laughs> person in history. I would I would think so. So yeah, yeah, Michigan State definitely helped me learn a lot about what else was out there and made made the connection to Fanner Regiment. Yeah, that 1988 um, Legacy Years DCI DVD is one of the first two that I owned because I love that Malaguena show so much. We played that show, actually. We played the Malaguena show at a football game. I think it was the Penn State game maybe one year. And CT just, or Chris Thompson, just handed us the charts. It was like still said Madison at the top of them, and they were all handwritten. And we like read them down, and he was like, man, I wish I'd have had you guys in 88. <laughs> Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Um, So obviously that's a pretty significant laundry list of accolades and accomplishments uh, through your career that we just, we, we drove through, but um, the purpose with that was to approach the next subject, which you had mentioned to me and I found super fascinating, uh, which is you have this theory about a lot of these WGI groups that do really well in today's, um, current setting or scores whatever you want to call it today's system but there are groups that have been around for decades a couple decades and you have a pretty interesting theory as to like kind of how they are the way they are why they are the way they are uh and it's all grouped around a book that you recommended that mike and i read which i did read almost all of i still have like three chapters left so i will admit that i haven't finished it yet but i'll let you kind of take it from there yeah, sure. Um, I get a lot about uh, you know, like the top five area of WGI independent world and how it's kind of, um, it's a really difficult nut to crack into. And really the only person to do it in the last 12 years or so is Broken City. Uh, but they're not, I don't consider them to be a new group necessarily because their designers aren't new. Uh, Mike Jackson's been around since the, the mid 90s. Um, and the, the book that I recommended is called The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And I had, I had read it years ago and was really interested about these little pockets and demographics of people. And there's three of them that he talks about in the book. One is software developers like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Bill Joy that does uh, Sun. Um, and that created, all three created them, Java. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was, he's a pretty talented dude. Um, But the three of them, they were all born within like three years of each other and uh, have gone on to be super successful. And one of the reasons is they were at the time that they started coding, um, they had just graduated from college. They had access to the 10,000 hours. They had access to coding machines and open labs that a lot of people didn't have. Um, so they were able to make a lot of mistakes without a lot of risk and they didn't already have jobs. So like the people that were born five years before them, they were already at IBM and they already like had a solid job. So they weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. They weren't trying to do anything new. They were just trying to, you know, lay down a full-time job. Um, and the same thing happened after the depression with a whole bunch of Jewish lawyers that had the same kind of demographic that lasted for years where that's this pocket of people um, that made it out of the depression due to a lot of factors. Read the book. Um, yeah. But I, I think that uh, a really interesting thing, and I had texted a bunch of these guys this week um, at the risk of using the term like top designer. I do think that there are a lot of people that stay in that realm up at the, up at the, uh, you know, top five of independent world that have been doing this for a long time. And I, I, I believe that a lot of us, and I, these are the people I include in this list, is me and Mike Jackson and Shane Gwaltney, Jim Wunderlich, and Sean Vega. So there was other dudes that came before us, like a Jay Webb or a Dave Marvin, Ward Durrett, people that were like pioneers of the activity. They had groups early on, which, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those kind of people. But there's this little pocket of people right around the late 90s that got a high school gig, whether it was Toctahatchee or Centerville or Mission Viejo. Um, and then eventually, once the independent thing started to catch up to Scholastic, because in those days, Scholastic was better than independent. It just, it just was. That also entered into an independent group. And 
at that time, like I remember going to championships and we would be in the tunnel. Dartmouth would be in front of us and Mission Viejo would be behind us. And there was no flow marching. There was no fan network. There was no YouTube. You just like did your thing. And then people from all over the United States showed up and then you got to watch. And you're like, okay, well, what's new this year is can you do electronics now? Are we using digitally screen printed floors? I've never seen the pit in that configuration. They have their snares doing what? Like we got to see all that stuff. And at the time we were just basically swinging for the fences and trying to figure out something cool to do because the rules hadn't been made yet. So like by the mid 2000s, there was a bunch of rules in drumline. You can't do this. You can't do that. This is going to sound bad if you do this. And, and I think that, the guys that were doing it in the late 90s, early 2000s, got the benefit of trying to actually set those rules. And because of that, I, that's where I consider our 10,000 hours of experience. Um, then we got it again over the next 20 years. We got, well, more than 10,000 of hours. But our initial approach of getting in there and trying new things and not looking at somebody else and saying, I want to do that, and follow those rules, I think gave us some, some sort of weird separation that allows for the fact that Shane is still at Mystique and they're a top five group. Mike is at Broken City and they're a top five group. I'm at Rhythm X, right? Like it's just, it's just always been kind of interesting. And then there was a new generation of people like the Mapes and Grom and Kevin Shaw and Andrew and all those dudes that came about 10 years later that they got to learn from all of our mistakes. Um, and, and I find that they're all really super talented, but also play by the rules a little bit more because when they came into the activity, there had been rules set up already. So that, that's my Malcolm Gladwell theory. So I you thought guys, one, go ahead, Mike, you guys got to experiment. Like you said, those <laughs> software designers did, or those programmers, you got to experiment and play around and take risks when there really wasn't any blowback or punishment from taking those risks. So you got to experiment, put in work, put in hours. And then when the time came to where WGI became what it was, the timing was right. You already had the work put in to then just take that, start a group, insert yourself into a group that already existed and run with it. You already played around with what would work, what wouldn't work. So that's interesting. I yeah, found the, the risk, the risk factor that you talk about is really important because at the time, like right now, to make independent world finals, there's 29 groups, right? Then there was like six or seven. Like I, I remember when Rhythm X came out and it was like, we could do whatever we wanted and we were still going to make finals. Like, oh, dang it, we were seventh. And then all of a sudden we were third and then they haven't looked back since then. But at the beginning, there like a group right now. To, and this is why I, I like this series because I, I really spend a lot of time with WGI. I love it. Um, but I consider myself to be very lucky. The time that I got into WGI, there was about five or six things that all fell into place for me to get into the positions that I did that have led to me to be able to make a career out of it. And if I was starting today, tomorrow, as a 22-year-old age out, it would be so hard. I mean, almost insurmountably hard. And uh, I just consider myself very lucky. Found that one of the the neatest parallels in the Malcolm Gladwell book um, to indoor was when they were talking about the Beatles and obviously the Beatles are a performing group and it referenced the 10,000 hours and the Beatles had a unique opportunity. I think they said they were going back and forth to Germany, um, the red light district maybe. And they would just play at these bars where they would play sets for like six, seven, eight hours at a time and they just got really good at performing. I mean, if you if you play live that many times, you're going to get better by just sheer volume. And at one point, I think they said that they did 1,200 performances in a 10-year span. And just like adding into those 10,000 hours in, it also attributed the White Album. They created it, I think, about eight to nine years into their, I guess, journey as a group. And they, so they were saying, like, really, it didn't, it didn't all happen right away, but like, it took them like eight or nine years to probably make their their best work. What people, some people would regard 
And so that's like almost a decade with thousands and thousands of hours of just like experimenting. And there was no risk really for them. I mean, they were just getting to play gigs and go and go and go and figure a lot of stuff out to where then you see them 10 years later and they're just like being on stage. Like it's just like walking down the street. Everybody always thinks and sees the end product. They don't really ever think about like what had to come before it. It's like you can look at the drum corps season kind of in the same vein. Why are they so good by the end? Because they perform more than other groups in other avenues of the activity in a short period of time, and they just get the hours in. That's why they're so good. And you look in August and go, everybody forgets June or May when you're in August at the end, and it's like they put in hours. And just at the end of the day, time time spent goes a long way. Yeah, and one of the things that I, those early years that we were all figuring out together – uh, as competitors was the visual part of it. Um, cause I, like I'm a snare drummer. That's, that's my, my roots. That's what I did. That's what I always thought I would always be. Um, and I do, I still love teaching percussion. Um, but in those early two thousands, um, like my first show that I did at Centerville, it was like, okay, well, write some drill, figure out how to figure out how to do this real fast. And there wasn't like hire this guy to do the drill and then bring in the choreo person and then have this person write the beat. And then this person does sound design. It was like, okay, well, Noah's going to write some stuff on the keyboards and then I'm going to do everything else because we've got 500 bucks total. So we were figuring out what visual even meant, you know, in those, some of those years, like when North Glen was coming out, they were doing the real theatric version. Um, and some people were more dancey and some people were more, you know, traditional college marching bandy, and everybody's trying to figure out what visual looks like in WGI, um, where at this point, it's pretty much figured out. Like, we know what it looks like. And there, there's some groups that have their own identities, but at that time, it was, it was you know, every man for themselves as far as what visual was like, um, which is, is always funny, like, because I'm often known as a, a visual guy. You know, that's one of my main jobs at many of the groups that I teach. Um but I, I, I like, I remember this happened at the Blue Coats one year. I was walking by like the snare line and, and I'm their drill writer, right? This guy is like, yeah, that guy writes the drill. Okay, cool. And I like walk by and I commented, I was left-hand interbeats aren't playing in the center of the drum. And he was like, oh, oh, oh okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> this guy actually knows what he's talking about. So, Dude, that's awesome. Uh, in a lot of those success stories, it was – people who are obviously talented and wanted to learn and wanted to grow. I mean, the Bill Gates thing, he was just eat up like in those people that you mentioned, like you and Shane and Jim and Sean Vega and Mike Jackson, obviously there is talent and an understanding to like grow yourself and the knowledge you have within the activity. But the Bill Gates thing, it was like the right place at the right time. They said that he went to a school that had a sharing terminal. Yeah, he had a love for coding, but he just happened to be in a place that had a terminal where he could do it, and it wasn't just, like, super laborious. It was actually fun and enjoyable. Um, yeah. And so, and like the, you mentioned... One of the things... I'm one of the, sorry. Uh, one of the things about Independent World right now, we are talking about Broken City and how they were able to break into that top five right away. Um, and I, I think that obviously Kevin Shaw is a brilliant arranger, but I think that Mike Jackson hit his early influences of doing things at Mission that were really, really unorthodox or creative or innovative that he was able to come out you know, 20 years later and be like, all right, yep, I'm bringing out an independent group and I'm going to change the way that it looks. I'm not going to look like anybody else. And Broken City doesn't look like anybody else. Well, now they do because everybody else looks like that. I was like getting that. ready to say it. Emulate. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, but I think because he's one of those outliers that he was able to swing in and just come in into the top five, which is uh, you know nearly impossible. Did he – well, did he also run Orange County Independent before, though? Wasn't that a thing? Yeah. Yeah, it was like OCI. Um, oh. I, don't know the, I don't know all the details, but I think that that was like a gig for them. Oh, okay. And then they like rebranded it and they were like, okay, this is our thing now. And now it's broken city. And they, and, and then, you know, took a big jump up more, his vision of what he wanted to do with yeah. it for sure. I think you'd have to check with those guys, but I'm pretty sure that's the right story. That makes sense. Um, 
but yeah, I just I, I really appreciate the re- the book recommendation. I still have a few chapters left to go just to finish it. Um, some of the stuff towards the end is a little more heavy. <laughs> Talk about like yeah. plane plane crashes and stuff. Um, there was there was one thing that I had, while reading it, I'm also though a few chapters from the end, but the part where they examined um, that scientist that followed a bunch of like IQ geniuses around through like their developmental years and kind of kept tabs on where they ended up. So basically, in a nutshell, to summarize this. Yeah, this researcher identified a bunch of geniuses with an IQ above a certain level, all ranging, all ranges above that level, super high, right at the threshold, whatever. He wanted to see this IQ have that much of an impact on the success of the person. Does it influence it that much? Is it that much of a leg up? And what he found was at a point, there was a threshold basically where if the IQ was at least this high, you had an increased chance of success, whether it's Nobel Prizes, good job, master's degree, whatever, however you want to quantify that. But how far above the threshold you were really didn't impact it that much. And the first thing that jumped out to me when I read that was, I've always looked at playing in a drum line kind of, I kind of related it to that. Take a snare line, for example. There's different skill sets involved in being in a snare line. You have to have a certain level of individual playing ability. You have to have listening ability. You have to be able to just be aware of your surroundings, all that kind of stuff, marching ability. And there's different levels of playing ability individually. When you look, go down the line of a snare line, some people you've always heard the term. I'm a line player. I'm not an amazing individual player, but I can fit into a sound play in time with people around me play clean. Well, that's that threshold. You've got to have a certain amount of playing ability to be a certain level of line player but there's always i've heard about tons of people where they're an individual player like their iq for example if you want to use that analogy is like 200 where the threshold's 140 but they're not that great of line players that would equate to those geniuses that had a 200 iq that weren't super successful on that setting i don't know my brain kind of just put those two things together if that made sense right when i read it i think the the broader point was like it helps to be smart, but like you don't have to be the smartest. Uh, exactly. It helps to be talented, but you don't have to be the most talented. 